everyone. This is Mrs. Jade. I'm doing a read aloud of Blood on the River, Jamestown 1607 by Elisa Carbone. We're on to chapter 11, page 81. Hereupon the president was contented the fort should be palisaded. The ordinance mounted, his men armed and exercised. William Simmons, ED, the proceedings. Reverend Hunt kneels with me in the dirt in front of the altar. He puts words to the prayers I cannot speak. Please take James' soul into heaven with you because he was just an innocent child. He then lays a hand on my shoulder. Samuel, he says, you've been here a long time. Have you finished your prayers yet? I shake my head. How can I finish praying for forgiveness? It was my fault, I say. My throat feels dry as sand. I should have explained to him the danger of running to the ships. I should have been kinder to him so that he would trust me. I should have been able to grab him and pull him back into the tent. I should not have let go when he bit me. I had so many chances to keep James safe, and I failed at all of them. Reverend Hunt stands and reaches down a hand to pull me up. I take his hand reluctantly and rise. He looks into my eyes. When our Lord spoke of forgiveness, he did not only mean forgiving others. Sometimes we have to forgive ourselves. I swallow past the lump in my throat. Now, go wash your face and see if there's any breakfast left. You won't be able to work if you don't eat. Reverend Hunt gives me a little push, and I leave the chapel. I trudge through the work of the day, sewing up holes in tents and mattresses, bringing water and food to our makeshift hospital where Dr. Watton tends to the wounded men, dumping more water on our wilting plants. Richard's eyes are red and swollen. I don't know what to say to him to make it any better. I don't think he wants to hear it from me anyway. I wonder if Richard will ever forgive me for my meanness to James while he was alive, and my failure to save him. That afternoon, Captain Smith, Captain Newport, and their party return. They say their Indian guide had acted strangely. He left them suddenly with no explanation. This made them suspicious that there was a raid that was being planned, so they sailed back to us as quickly as they could. They are dismayed to find that they were right. In the evening, the council calls a meeting to discuss our situation. I creep near the cabin where the council members are talking so that I could eavesdrop. These are not just disorganized people living in towns here and there, says Captain Newport. They are tribes with an empire. Their emperor is called the Powhatan. The people are called the Powhatans. And the river we named the James River, they already call the Powhatan River. They are a kingdom of warriors. The boys are taught how to use a bow and arrow when they are six years old. Their mothers don't even give them breakfast until they have a shot their targets in the morning. When the great chief Powhatan wants to conquer a new tribe, the warriors get the job done very quickly. There is a prophecy they told us about, says Master Percy. The bay we first entered on our way here is called the Chesapeake Bay. They they are used to be a tribe, the Chesapeake's living on its shores. The prophecy says that a threat to Chief Powhatan's empire will come to the Chesapeake Bay. When he heard this, he sent his warriors, and in one day, they wiped out the entire Chesapeake tribe. There must have been 400 of them last night, said Captain Gosnold. If it had not been for the cannon scaring them off, they would have killed us all easily. There is a silence then. No one wants to tell President Wingfield that he was wrong and Captain Smith was right about building a palisade. I think. President Wingfield, to his credit, had been at the forefront of the battle. Those who saw him said that he fired his musket even as arrows went right past through his beard. I hold my breath. Please, someone tell him we need to build a strong fort. All right. President Wingfield's voice breaks the silence. There will be watches, armed men at every corner, and shifts throughout the day and night. And, he hesitates for a moment, tomorrow we will build construction of a tall palisade with not so much as a crack between the posts. I let out my breath and creep away before anyone catches me listening. Fear makes us work fast. We fell trees and make them into a palisade post with wickedly sharp tips. We dig a trench in a large triangle around our tent and plant our posts so close together that an arrow cannot get through. Each corner of the triangle is rounded like a half moon with a platform inside. We bring cannons from the ships and mount them on the platforms. We are making a fort like soldiers in a war. Thank goodness the sailors are still with us. They, along with our laborers and soldiers and the other working men, are the ones with the strength and speed to get the job done. If we had to depend on the gentlemen, many of whom don't want to dirty their velvet, we would be at the mercy of the Indians for many more weeks. As it is, the natives mount small attacks every other day 
on any man or creature who strays too far from our guarded half-built fort. They shoot Master Clovel while he's out hunting. He comes running back with the f- to the fort with arrows sticking out of him and dies soon after. They shoot and kill another man in the woods when he drops his slops to relieve himself. They even shoot one of Captain Newport's dogs while she is sniffing after a rabbit. Captain Smith finds me using a hatchet to sharpen the palisade post tips. He is holding a belt, sheath, sword, and army armor. I recognize the sword. It has a seam molded into the handle. It belonged to Master Clovel, whose grave I just helped dig. Samuel, do you think you could put some of that energy from your fist fights into learning to use a sword? Captain Smith asks. My hatchet stops midair. Yes, sir, I say, trying not to sound too eager. You are, after all, an apprentice to an officer, he says. It's time to begin your training. I lay my tools on the ground and wipe my hands on my slops. You're lucky, Captain Smith says. Master Clovel was a slight man. His belt and armor will fit you well. And they won't fit Henry or Abram, or any of the other unarmed men who want them, I think. With arrows flying every day, weapons and armor are more coveted than gold. Captain, you're not taking my worker, are you? John Layden asks. He's the carpenter overseeing the building of the Palisades. I better take him now and teach him a thing or two so he'll live to work another day, Captain Smith says. John Layden nods, and I've got permission to leave. Master Clovel's armor is a bit big, but it fits well enough. I will grow into it. The breastplate makes me feel like I have a large chest. I wrap my knuckles on it and admire the clang. No arrow can pierce this metal. The helmet is heavy. I feel like a soldier already. Will I have a musket too, I ask? First, you will learn to use a sword, Captain Smith says. I fasten the belt around my waist and pull the sword out of its sheath. The handle is smooth and cool. The sword is heavy. It glints in the sun. I take it in both hands and whip it through the air. It makes a sharp whoosh. Captain Smith begins my instruction. I want to think about the sword, but he tells me I must think about my feet, and I watch his feet as well. It is like dancing, he says but I never learned to dance, so it's all new. It is the dance of death with your opponent, he says. You mirror his steps until you see a weak spot, and then you lunge. He suddenly steps forward, knee bent, and I am struck in the chest with his blade. I gasp, looking down. Captain Smith laughs at my terrified expression. Did you forget you were wearing armor? I let out my breath in a rush. No, I lie. You must block me. Do not let me enter your circle. Slowly, he goes in again for a lunge. I think fast, swat his sword with my blade, knock it off its course toward my chest. Very good, he shouts. We pattern our steps in the slow dance, him giving me time to balance his movements with my own. He raises his eyebrows when he's about to strike, his signal to me to protect myself. I hear the satisfying clang of my swords as we knock, I knock his away. We speed up now, our feet moving more and more quickly. No time for thought now, only reaction. I am out of breath, sweating, our swords clanging, ringing out. He's always one step ahead of me, always quicker. I am tiring. Then I see a gap, my chance to enter his circle. I step forward and lunge. Suddenly, there is scraping, a pain in my hand, and then my sword is wrenched from my grasp. It lands on the ground behind me, and I stand there unarmed with Captain Smith's sword hovering just in front of my throat. I am defeated. But Captain Smith laughs. It is going to take a long time to learn to use the sword properly, Samuel. Go pick it up. I rub my sore fingers and then move them until they feel better. Then I grasp the sword again, narrow my eyes, and concentrate. I will try again. Captain Smith moves slowly at first, giving me a chance to find my rhythm. Then he speeds up as before, and I follow. I put my mind aside and my feet, and I feel only my body. Stepping, moving, the dance of death sweeps us into our circle. Our swords clash and clang. My breath comes in short gasps. I see an opening. I lunge. My blade finds its mark. The tip presses into Captain Smith's armor, just above his heart. He holds up his hand, drops his sword, and speaks slowly. The student, he says gravely, has impaled the teacher. I begin to shake my head. I did not mean to anger him. Then he breaks into a broad smile. I wipe beads of sweat from my face. My hand is shaking. We will train every day, he tells me. Wear your armor whenever you leave the fort. The sword will be no match for flying arrows. But tomorrow I will begin to teach you to use another weapon, one that is much more powerful than a sword. I nod calmly, 
but inside I'm excited. Tomorrow, I will learn to use a musket.